Well, we're in Daniel chapter 3, and this is going to be a, 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 such an important lesson because of the applications that I want to make in this lesson today. Because you're going to walk out of here, hopefully, a very thoughtful person because you're going to be thinking about some of the things that we'll be talking about that apply to how you live your life. Anyway, that's my goal. Let's ask God to bless our time in the Word. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much for the teachings which you give us through Holy Scripture and the examples that you give from history that can be so applicable to us even today. So Lord, use this time for your glory, for your honor, but for our embitterment. In Jesus' name I pray. I'm sure you've heard that worn out teaching that says that once you become a believer in Jesus Christ, everything is going to work out hunky-dory, everything is going to be fine, your whole life is going to be like a bed of roses. And you know that isn't true. It's not even practical thinking. But it is part of one of the doctrines that are being taught today. In fact, the Word of Faith movement, the New Apostolic Reformation movement, is the fastest growing movement of, quote, Christianity in the world today. And that is the very thing they teach. In fact, here are six principles that they believe. Number one, God wants you to be healthy. You just need to confess and believe it. So if you're sick, there's something wrong with you spiritually. God wants you wealthy. You just need to confess and believe it. God wants your life to be comfortable and easy. Your confession controls your outcomes. So what you speak is ultimately what's going to happen to you. If you speak a lot of negative thoughts, a lot of problems are going to come your way. If you speak positively, everything's going to be fine. God wants you to have everything you need. Your negativity is your problem. God already sent Jesus to die for your abundant life. Your faith is the problem. If you're not at life, you have too little faith. Now get this last one. God has already sent Jesus to pay for your debt so you can be debt free. Obviously, we're talking about sin in Scripture, but the Word of Faith movement, the New Apostolic Reformation movement is talking about your money. The Bible affirms repeatedly that Christians will be persecuted and suffer unjustly. The Apostle Peter puts it like this, For the sake of our conscience towards God, a man bears up under sorrows and hang unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if you do what is right and suffer for it, and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So when we suffer unjustly for Christ's sake and endure it with patience, God is well pleased with us. And that is the very reason why God was well pleased with the three Hebrew children who refused to bow before an image that Nebuchadnezzar put up representing himself. And they were treated unjustly, but they endured it patiently. They endured it in faith. And so what I want us this familiar story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace is how to find favor with God when faced with the tough and unfair treatment that may come our way simply because we are believers. So let's look at the first seven verses of Daniel chapter 3, the command by Nebuchadnezzar for a golden image. Notice the construction of the golden image. Now, when we get back to chapter 2, which we were a couple of weeks ago, remember that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a statue. And that statue was made of various metals that represented the various empires that would rule over the Jewish people. But the head on that was of gold. And Daniel said in interpreting the dream, that head of gold is you, Nebuchadnezzar. That is your Babylonian kingdom, but that kingdom is not going to last forever because other kingdoms are going to come and conquer you, even though Nebuchadnezzar at the time thought, hey, my kingdom will last forever. Now we see 
where Nebuchadnezzar wants a golden image made of himself. And so he calls his head masons, his designers, his gold embossers to erect a statue of his image. The height of that image is 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and it's made of gold. So if it's solid gold or if it's gold-plated, but we do know the ancient city of Babylon was a city of gold. The uh, palace of Nebuchadnezzar was made of gold. The throne of Nebuchadnezzar was made of gold. And so gold has become a symbol of Babylon. And now we have this tremendous statue, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide of gold. And that represents Nebuchadnezzar. Now we do not know when this command was given. But interestingly, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, there is an insert in there. There's a little statement that says that this command to build this image came in the year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, approximately 16 years after his dream that Daniel interpreted that we talked about in Daniel chapter 2. Now, if the Septuagint is correct, this statue was erected around 586 B.C. There's something else that happened in 586 B.C. We should always remember that date because that is the time when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, and brought the Jewish people into captivity. So now the question is, why build this image at that time? Because, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar's proud of himself. He defeated the God of Israel, conquered the Jewish people. He conquered their God. That's how he thinks. And secondly, he's bringing them into his domain and he wants them to worship his gods, and particularly, he wants them to worship him. That's why the image was constructed. So he wants to brainwash the Jewish people. He wants to say to them, you can no longer worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can no longer worship your God. You have got to conform to our way of doing things, and it's going to begin by you worshiping me. Now, notice the causes for the image. We've spoken a little bit of that, but we're, we'll go into this in a little more detail. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to unify his empire and consolidate his authority. That's the first reason for this. Remember, he's bringing the Jews into captivity. So emperors have learned that the surest way to unify an empire is to develop a common religion. If everyone in the kingdom is worshiping the same God, it can very well unify a very diversified people. That was the very idea behind the Caesars of Rome when they established Caesar worship. You might remember in our study of the book of Revelation, we talked a lot about Caesar worship. Throughout the Roman Empire, there were cities where people of the Roman Empire had to go to those cities nearest to their, their homes. They had to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar. They had to declare Caesar as Lord. They would receive some kind of certificate that would enable them to buy or sell. But that was the Caesar's way of unifying the empire. You could worship any god you wanted to worship, but everybody was to pay homage to Caesar. That was the very motivation behind the kings of England to establish a state church. Anytime a state has brought persecution upon religion, it has been for one purpose, to make all the people conform to one religion. Now, folks, we can see this happening in America today, and this is going to be alarming to us because secularism and humanism has now become the fastest growing religious philosophy in America. I just read this last week or two. This startled me. Witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in America today. Atheism, witchcraft, the occult, it all goes together. It's growing faster than Christianity. There are more people becoming witches in America than are getting converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to shock us. And so what we're seeing is that they have an agenda, and that agenda is to destroy Christianity. They attack by intimidating the true believer in Christ. 
We are called anti-intellectual, right-wing religious, and that's religious zealots, emotionally weak people who need God as a crutch to lean on. <laughs> you know, that's, they laugh at us. They think we're stupid. And of course, if you're pro-life, then you're sexist, bigoted, and misogynistic. Did you notice that the, uh, when the President Trump gave his, and talked about pro-life, who stood and who sat? I won't name the parties. But if you don't support uh, gay marriage, you're homophobic. If you do not support gender diversity, you're transphobic. Name-calling has been the strategy to get the believer to cower and to destroy Christianity and allow a politically correct Darwinian naturalistic worldview to prevail. You see, Nebuchadnezzar is doing the very same thing. We've now legalized all this in our, but now in ancient Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, this is law. You see, but he's just doing things his way. He builds his golden image to cement his conquered, diverse providence, providence, uh, providence of people into one common kingdom. Now, not only can one religion unify a diverse people, but if the government can force one belief upon its citizens, then it, control, then it can control that religion and use it for its own purposes. Th this is so, so important what I want you to understand. If the government can begin to control religion, government can begin to control the churches then it can tell the churches exactly what they have to teach. And that means that we perhaps would not be free to teach the gospel. And there's already a movement in this country to shut down these rights guaranteed by our Constitution. I saw an article in Christianity Today. This ought to alarm us. January the 11th, 2012. President Obama declared that churches had no First Amendment protection to hire their own minister. It didn't get through Congress, but did you hear that? We would have absolutely no right to hire Eric Geiger as our pastor if President Obama had his way. The government would tell us who's going to be behind the pulpit in this church. And as far as Obama was concerned, we would have a pastor who is not pro-life, who is supportive of the LGBTQ community, and everything else that the Word of God deplores. You understand that? Do you see where we're headed in this country? Do you see why this coming election is so important? You see, there's already a movement in this country to shut down these rights guaranteed by our Constitution. Elizabeth Warren just said recently, dealing with a case in the state of Montana and Christian schools, you know what she's saying? They ought, we, we should not fund them. We should get rid of them. Why? Because they discriminate. They hire only Christian teachers. Oh, well, it's a Christian school, you know. And they discriminate against the LGBTQ community. Yes, the day is going to come when there's going to be a one-world religion. Daniel's going to talk about that as we move through this book. And all who do not conform to this one world religion will be martyred, according to the book of Revelation. Nebuchadnezzar's image is but a sign of things yet to come. So first of all, Nebuchadnezzar wants to unify the empire. That's why he has built this image. Secondly, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to deify. Some people have a psychological need of self-deification. That was Nebuchadnezzar. 
when he had that giant statue raised in the plains of Babylon, he was saying, you don't need God. You are not dependent on any heavenly power. You can settle your own problems and meet your own needs. Just do what I say. See, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. That's just the idea behind the whole thing. I'm God. You listen to me. Well, this ought to sound familiar to us. Because that is the very core of secular humanism. When man makes himself out to be... Mankind is the epoch of the universe and is part of a divine force called God. That is the principle behind Hinduism, Buddhism, Christian science, theosophy, and the New Age movement. And I'm going to show you as we move through the book of Daniel that that is exactly where the Antichrist and the false religion is going to come from. It's going to come from out of the occult. It's going to come from out of the New Age movement, which is the fastest growing movement in our nation today and Europe as well. Their motto is, all is one, all is God. I'm God, you're God, the trees out there, grass is God, the universe is God. We're just all part of the same thing. Adolf Hitler was an anti-type of Nebuchadnezzar. That is, when you study the life of Adolf Hitler, and you kind of look back and you can see exactly Nebuchadnezzar. Pastor David Jeremiah, in his book, The Handwriting on the Wall, quotes a statement from Hitler, which he made back in the 1930s. Here it is. One cannot be a good German and at the same time deny God, but an avowal of faith in the eternal Germany is an avowal of faith in the eternal God. Whoever serves Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, serves Germany. And whoever serves Germany serves God. Jeremiah goes on to say this. Later on in 1942, this was written. There's a lot of talk in Germany about Hitler's messianic characteristics. The thesis that Hitler is a miraculous being sent by a supernatural power and that he's capable of mystic communications with the German masses and gaining greater currency. Consequently, the attack on Christ becomes more severe. In Germany, no attempt is made to stamp out the faith in the supernatural. The policy is more blasphemous. It is to replace Christ. Religion is now counterfeited rather than missed. This extraordinary tendency is perhaps without parallel during the last 2,000 years. The Nazis are trying to create an anti-type of Christianity. They have made their leader their God. Hitler was claiming for himself what Nebuchadnezzar claimed, self-deity. When the Antichrist appears, he too will make him as God. Remember, the Apostle Paul teaches us that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's going to be a temple that ultimately will be built on Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. It will be the third temple that's going to take place after we are out of here. So, praise God. But the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to establish a covenant between the Jews and the Arabs. And that temple is going to be built. Listen, the, uh, the deal of the century, which you heard about, does not mean that Trump is the Antichrist, nor is Netanyahu the Antichrist. Understand that? There's a lot between that peace agreement and what the Antichrist is going to establish. So, there's going to be a temple built. It's going to take perhaps the first three and a half years of the tribulation to build that temple. In the middle of the tribulation, this is what Paul is teaching us now, the son of perdition, that's the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist is going to stand in the third temple yet to be built and say, I am God. 
Any religion or movement that teaches the deification of mankind is not only dangerous, but it is of the devil. Who? In the very beginning got Adam and Eve to sin by convincing them if they would only eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they could be like God. Here's what Satan is doing today. He's taking us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What was the sin in the Garden of Eden? Well, you don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if uh, you would eat of it, what is going to happen? So say, you're going to become like God. You're going to become God as wise. You're going to become as knowledgeable as God is knowledgeable. You're going to become like God. And the whole occult movement today, the whole witchcraft movement today, the whole New Age movement today, which is sweeping across our country, is falling for that lie. Because people are saying, I'm God. One, all is one, all is God. Man, see, I am deity. <laughs> You're deity. See, that's, that's where we are today. Satan is coming back with the same lie he used to get Adam and Eve to commit sin. So, the first thing I want us to see is uh, these uh, images were done to unify the empire, and then to deify Nebuchadnezzar. Now notice the conformers who bowed to the golden image. After the image was completed, Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble all his officials, quote, to come to the dedication of the image. Once the state authorities were assembled before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the king's herald proclaimed the message. At the time you hear the sound of music, you shall fall down and hold the image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship the image shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Confronted by the king's command and probably within earshot of the roaring furnace, the governmental authorities conformed and bowed down and paid image to the statue when the orchestra began to play. Nebuchadnezzar was asking something impossible here, and that is to command worship. See, I want you to worship me. If you don't worship me, I'm going to burn you to death. See, that's what he's saying. So he's, he's really putting a, a difficult situation in front of people. But he's being worship. You can't command worship any more than you can command somebody to love you. You can't go up to somebody and say, I want you to love me with all of your heart or I'm going to punch you in the mouth. doesn't work that way. You might get a, some kind of response, but I'll tell you, it won't be a loving one. You see, God created us as free moral agents, and because He wants us to love Him voluntarily, and out of that love, worship Him. God could have made us like puppets, and God is up there in heaven pulling the strings, and we're doing this. God could have made us like a computer, and He's up there pushing, doing exactly what He wants us to do. You know what? There would be no sin. There would be no evil. Everything in the world would be full of peace. And you would say, man, that's great. But you wouldn't even be human. You would not have any choice. You could not even love because love cannot be coerced. Love cannot be commanded. Love Worship is clearly forbidden by God. It violates the first two of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make any carved image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Idolatry is a corruption of true worship, abomination to God. It is hateful to God. It is something that is vain and foolish. The psalmist says, it is something that is irrational, Paul says. It is defiling, Ezekiel says. It is unprofitable, the book of Judges teaches. Idolatry makes men forget God, to go astray from God, 
to pollute the name of God, to turn God's creation into gods, get this now, where people worship the created rather than the creator. Folks, that is the very agenda behind climate change. It all began back in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And it all began with a satanic ritual of all the people who gathered in Rio. And the whole purpose is to reduce the world's population down to about 2 million, according to Ted Turner. We want to get rid of 7 billion, 2 billion, 2 billion people. We want to get rid of 5 billion people. See? Because we want to have a one world government. We, and, and we can't have too many because they're destroying the environment. Don't just think this is some kind of earth saving thing. I mean, listen, God controls the weather, not man. There's an agenda behind all this. One does not have to bow to an image of gold to be an idol worshiper. A few years ago, Christianity Today asked a panel of Christian scholars, what are the most prevalent gods of our time? And some of the answers were the anti-Christian welfare state, scientism, nationalism, conservative, conservative, social justice, humanism. Dr. Andrew Blackwood, professor emeritus of uh, Princeton, spoke in how personal, uh, spoke in more personal terms. He said this, America has these following gods, self, money, pleasure, sex, romance, sports, education. I remember a while back I was out to dinner with some pastoral friends and the topic of idolatry came up. And so one of the men said this, the God of our nation is big government. Hmm. In other words, the government, we're looking to Uncle Sam to take care of us. See? We want everything free. That's our God. The truth is anything that is more important to you than God becomes your idol and if you continue to make it the number one priority of your life over the God of creation, then in the end, that God will be your destruction. Now let's look at verses 8 through 18. We're talking here about the courage of three Hebrew children. Notice the accusation of the astrologers. When the throng of government leaders touch their head, now they're bowing before this golden image, Three Hebrew children remain standing. Let's get that picture. That's a good picture there. What courage <laughs> that would be. Everybody, I don't know how many people, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands are bowing, but there are three who refuse to bow. Now, the astrologers who conformed noticed the three Hebrews did not. So they became the informers. The text says, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Obviously, these informers were a bit jealous of the Hebrews since they had outclassed them before the king in every way. That takes us back to chapter 2. Remember how one of the reasons for the cream of the canal of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar back in 605 B.C. is he wanted to find wonderful young men who could assist him in running his kingdom. He wanted the finest young men possible. And so he gets this contest going. And it was Daniel and his three friends who ended up as top of the class, even above his own astrologers, even above his own wise men. So there's a bit of jealousy here. Notice what Solomon says about jealousy. Jealousy burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. So the Chaldeans wanted to smell the burning of the flesh of these three Hebrews, Shadrach and Abednego. The jealousy of Nebuchadnezzar's leaders was burning like a blazing fire. Now notice the difference in decision-making between the government leaders and the three Hebrew children. This, this, this becomes the crux of this lesson. This 
is really what I want all of us to learn today, what I'm going to be talking about now. Our decisions, our attitudes, and our behaviors are based on two things, external pressure or internal principle. External pressure, the world out there is pressuring us to do the very thing not do. Do we give in or internal principle? Is the word of God in our heart far more important? And are we going to stand when everybody else is bowing? That's the conflict that every one of us face on a daily basis. Just a humorous article. In January 1980, before the Los Angeles Rams played in the Super Bowl against the Pittsburgh Steelers, I should have given this lesson last week, an article appeared in the Los Angeles Times about presidential candidate Ronald Reagan. He was leaving a press conference in New Hampshire when someone fired a question at him. Who do you like in the Super Bowl? Tation, the former governor of California, and now the presidential hopeful said, the Rams. Then a light apparently went on in his brain. He paused and then said, I am not running for governor anymore. May the best team win. You know, it's amazing how fickle our loyalties are. Dependent on certain external pressures, we get swayed so easily by the circumstances and who we want to influence. This is just part of life for most people. We are influenced more by external pressure than by internal principle. Therein lies the difference between Nebuchadnezzar officials and the three Hebrew children. The officials bowed before the golden image based on external pressure. You bow or get thrown into a fiery furnace. The three Hebrew children refused to bow based on internal principle because they said, my God would not be honored by me bowing. See? What we need are God-fearing people who operate their lives on internal principles, who don't succumb to external pressures. I, you know, I'm talking to myself, too. I want, you to, I want you to know that. I fight this all the time. I know you do, too. We're all humans. We're supposed not to succumb to external principles. We need... Believers who refuse to vacillate or compromise or act on external pressure, rather, that stay true to God no matter what the external pressure might be that would cause them to forsake their God. I was reading about Studdard Kennedy, who was an Anglican minister and chaplain during World War I. He had a young son at home in Worcester, England, whom he wrote to on a regular basis. When he was in the trenches in France, he saw the war at its worst. In writing to his son following a horrific battle, and he's actually writing through his wife because his son is too uh, need, but he wants his son to understand this. The first prayer I want my son to learn to say for me is not, God, keep daddy safe. The first prayer I want my son to pray is, God, make daddy brave. And if he has hard things to do, make him strong to do them. Life and death don't matter, my son. Right and wrong do. Daddy dead is daddy still. But daddy dishonored before God is something too awful for words. I suppose you'd like to put a bit about safety too, and mother would. Well, put it in afterwards. Always afterwards, for it doesn't matter nearly as much. Stuttered Kennedy was right. Daddy dead is daddy still. But daddy compromised is something awful. Here was a man that operated his life not by external pressure but by internal principle. I read too about Stephen Girard. He was an unbelieving millionaire in Philadelphia years ago. He told his clerks one Saturday that they had to come in the next day and unload a shipment which had just arrived. The next day, being Sunday, one young man nervously approached Gerard and told him, I can't work on Sunday. Well, said Gerard, if you cannot do as I wish, we can separate. I know that, sir, said the young man, and I know, too, that I have a widowed mother to care for, but I cannot work on Sunday. Very well, 
said Gerard. Go to the cashier's clerk, and he will settle with you. For three long weeks, the young man was out of work, but he looked hard to find a job. And one day, a bank president asked Gerard to name a suitable person for a cashier for a new bank to be started. And after reflecting for a few moments, Gerard named the young man he just fired. But I thought you fired him, said the bank president. I did, replied Gerard, because he was Sunday. And I tell you, the man who will lose his job on account of principle is the man with whom you can trust your money to. And this young man made his decision, not by external pressure, but by internal principle. Someone was talking to me uh, several months ago about applying for a job for Toyota. They had to fill out an application. Here are the questions they had to answer. Do you belong to the LGBT community? Yes or no? Are you a heterosexual? Yes or no? If heterosexual, do you support the LGBT community? Yes or no? Stop and think about that for a moment. If you say you don't support the LGBT community, you possibly won't get the job. That's why that question is there. Well, let's get to the anger of the king. We're seeing now where the king's pretty angry because uh, these three Hebrews and they're standing, everybody else is bowing. This is uh, beginning at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. The king then repeated his orders. This time he gave direct orders that they were to bow before the golden image or be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Then he adds a bit of sarcasm. And who is the God that will deliver you from my hand? <laughs> you know, I'm going to cast you in there. Who is going to deliver you? Nobody. Now notice the answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Now, that is what you call operating by internal principle. And you talk about nerve. You talk about faith. Who among us? has such internal principle, such faith, that we would defy such orders from the king at the risk of our life. If there's ever a time to stand firm, to refuse external pressure, and live by divine internal principle, church, it's now. The enemy is on the attack, and his strategy right now is to reach our children. In the state of California, our children are being taught as young as kindergarten about sexuality and that homosexuality and transgenderism is normal. Libraries throughout the nation are hosting drag queens for a story hour which is celebrated as part of LGBTQ Big Read event. Isn't she cute? In 2018, the state of California was going to outlaw all books that spoke against homosexuality, which would include the Bible. Fortunately, the legislatures realized that might not be such a politically astute move right now. So they backed off on it. However, be assured, when they think it is a good time politically to ban the Bible, they will. For the first time in their history, the Democratic putting God out of their platform and going after the non-religious.
more and more. There's a movement in this country towards secular humanism and the dismissal of God in his word. That means we as the church must take a stand. What will it be? Will we give in to external pressure like the astronomers and Chaldeans and officials of Nebuchadnezzar? Or will we be true to our convictions like the three Hebrew children and stand for divine internal principles? I have said this in this class. I'll say it again, even if it costs me my job. I blame, I blame the churches for the moral decline of our nation. I blame our pastors for refusing to stand in the pulpit and teach against the things that we've talked about today. And the reason why they don't do it is because we don't want to lose anybody. Well, thanks for letting me get that off my chest. I believe the church has to take a stand. Well, let's bring this chapter to a close. Verses 19 through 30, the conviction of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice the penalty from an angry king here, beginning at verse 19. See, the response of the three Hebrew children was intolerable to the king. So the text says this, Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. He spoke and commanded that his minions heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the fiery furnace. The furnace was so hot that the flames leaped out, killing five members of his army. Now beginning at verse 24, notice the presence of May. For a moment, it looked like the three Hebrew children had breathed their last. Then, the text says, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, look. He answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The king couldn't believe his eyes. Not only were the Hebrew children still alive, but they were free and moving about with someone who had the appearance of deity. Coming as close to the furnace of Likud, Nebuchadnezzar called the three Hebrew children to, quote, come out and come here. After they all emerged from the flames, they were inspected by all the government officials that had witnessed the miracle. The Babylonians discovered that their bodies and clothes showed no signs of being burned. They did not even smell of fire. The only thing destroyed in the fire was their bonds. God had sovereignly chosen to deliver them from the flames and demonstrated his authority over the king. And who was the man? that is called the fourth man in the fire? It was the Son of God. It was none other than Jesus Christ himself. This a theophany or a Christophany. Listen, Jesus existed before his virgin birth. That is, the God in Jesus existed. You see, the book of Micah says that, that the Messiah is from everlasting to everlasting. That's a good verse to bring up to, I think it's, uh, Micah 5, what is it, 5, 2, something like that. That's a good verse to share with the Jehovah Witnesses when they come to the door. Jesus is the eternal God. And in the Old Testament, there are times when he makes appearances. He's often referred to as the angel of the Lord. Here, he appears as the fourth man in the... Well, what did he do for them? He saved them. He delivered them whole without spot or blemish or smell. Jesus does that same work for us today. And I'll tell you how. You know, we as the church are the bride of Christ. Christ is the bridegroom. And the day is going to come when Jesus, the bridegroom, is going to come in the air. And we as the church are going to be caught up in the air. And there's going to be a wedding in the sky. Now, Paul talks about us having a wedding gown. This is metaphor, of course. Uh, a wedding gown. The church is going to be wearing a wedding gown because there's going to be a wedding. But notice that wedding gown. It's 
without spot, without wrinkle. There's no soil. It's pure. Why? Well, we're sinners. We deserve to be in the flame. But Jesus Christ died on the cross. He took all of our sins. He gave us His righteousness. We are justified in the eyes of God, which means what? That God views each one of us just as if, I'm going to use the word I, just as if I'd never sinned at all. He views you as though you never sinned at all because you're now pure and you're holy. Yes, we sin. That's the practical aspect. But there's a positional aspect, and the positional aspect is God simply declares it because he sees Christ in us. Well, notice next, the praise of the king. When the king saw the Son of God and the three Hebrew children unharmed, he was convicted. Notice now beginning at verse 28. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to deliver his servant, uh, who put their trust in him, delivered his servant, rather, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies as so as not to worship or serve any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any nation or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no God who is able to deliver in this way. Then Nebuchadnezzar called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Notice what these Hebrew children were able to get Nebuchadnezzar to do to praise God. Blessed be the God who sent His angel and delivered His servants. You see, when we live our life by internal principle and not by external pressure, we can win people to Christ. And at least temporarily, I, I don't know how long, but there seems to be reason to believe that Nebuchadnezzar finally comes around and does believe in this God, and we'll get there in a few weeks. Well, I want us to see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were transformers. Their faith in God was honored, and their influence was enlarged. They were promoted, and when God tests us and we prove faithful, He enlarges our influence so we can be greater transformers for Him. And Paul reminds us of our promotion and its tremendous influence when he writes that. This ought to be oh, such a great verse. Romans eight seventeen. Now, if we are children of God, then we are heirs of God. We are joint heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in His suffering in order that we may share in His glory. Now, we share in His suffering. But because we put our faith in Him, we become adopted members of the family of God. Now, here's the point. We now become heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Understand what this means, that the very same inheritance that the Son, Jesus, receives from His Father, every one of us will receive. Isn't that great? And you know what that is? Psalm We're going to rule and reign with Christ over the heathen nations of the world during the time of the millennia. So if there's any truth to the prosperity gospel, it is not in this lifetime. This life is for a time of testing. Do we live by external pressure or do we live by, by internal principles? However, in the life to come, when Christ sets up His millennial kingdom on earth, that is when we will truly prosper as we become heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. We have something to look forward to. One story and I'll John Chrysostom was one of the Greek church fathers. He died in 407. And as a very young Christian, he was brought before the emperor who said if he would not give up Christ, he would be banished from the country. Chrysostom, you cannot, for the whole world is my father's land. You can't banish me, the emperor. Then I will take all your property. You cannot, my treasures are in heaven. Then I will take you to a place where there is not a friend to talk to. You cannot. I have a friend who is closer than a brother. I shall have Jesus Christ forever. 
the emperor finally threatened, then I'll take your life. You cannot. Life is hidden with God in Christ. And at last the frustrated emperor said, what do you do with a man like that? Here's the thought I want to leave you with. This is the crux of this whole lesson. I can put it in a sentence. We are to live by internal principle and not by external pressure. And if we live that way, God will bless our lives. And I want everyone here to have a blessing. Amen?